When you think of the Wild West, you probably picture a dusty town full of manly gamblers and cowboys. Most people have no idea just how much of the West was run, operated, and settled by women. More specifically, the women who ran brothels, aka madams. Madams used their appearance, experience, and strong-willed personalities to generate tons and tons of dough, sometimes employing brutality to get their money. Today we're exploring what it was like to be a madam at a Wild West saloon. Considering at the time LinkedIn wasn't close to existing and women couldn't just apply for any old job, being a madam was really the only route to independent wealth that a woman could have. Madams recognize how to make money and put this skill to good use. Famous madams like Maddie Silks and Jenny Rogers use their money to expand their businesses, pay off local politicians, and even add some legitimacy to their trade. Maddie Silks acquired a liquor license in 1885, which was an unusual permit for establishments at the time. For her part, Jenny Rogers invested her earnings into the city of Denver's irrigation and reservoir infrastructure, resulting in a healthy profit. Dolores Jara of Helena, Montana, had enough money to give out loans to other women. Madams also bought properties, ran shops, and took part in other business opportunities. Basically, they parlayed their sinful jobs into hugely successful business empires. Many madams actually spent time as hookers prior to or in addition to their managerial duties. Often older than their workers, madams had experience in the trade and learned from their time as active ladies of the night. Turning tricks obviously wasn't looked highly upon at the time, and some women who engaged in this type of labor were cringingly known as soiled doves. Yikes. No wonder doves cry. One madam, Dora Dufran, made a living as a working girl and a performer before opening several saloons and parlors of her own in South Dakota in the late 1900s. The self-proclaimed youngest madam in the West, Maddie Silks, was just 19 when she earned that title. What a prodigy. She and other madams, like Jesse Reeves and Laura Evans, used their past experience to guide them when they became madams. Both were known for being no-nonsense, strong women. To demonstrate their immense wealth and total baller status, and to appear reputable, madams wore the nicest clothes and the most decadent jewelry as a way to sell themselves as the owners of fine, high-class establishments. The finest brothels and boarding houses run by the likes of Jesse Reeves needed a proprietor who looked and behaved appropriately, and these women certainly looked the part. Reeves, in particular, made sure her girl's attire projected a high-class image. She even loaned her staff money so they could purchase elegant garments, including hats, shoes, dresses, and gloves. Sadie Orchard, a boarding house owner in New Mexico, appreciated proper English women's style and made every attempt to imitate it. Pearl DeVere, a madam who was up in Cripple Creek, Colorado, was a former dressmaker and spent her days riding through the gold camp in an embellished carriage. Wherever there's blood flowing, there's a demand for courtesans, and the Wild West was no exception. Madams in the Wild West identified an unmet business need and were more than happy to fulfill it. While some people disapproved of the activities at parlor houses, many groups in the West, including some Native American tribes, acknowledged the trade's important role. Gertrudis Barcello, aka Madam Tools, recognized this and used her gambling habit and feminine charm to obtain money to start an establishment in New Mexico during the mid-1800s. Tools seduced several men to get the capital she needed to open her establishments. Many madams were former working girls themselves, and some even continued to sell their bodies while also working as madams. Madams who engaged in actual acts typically saved themselves for the upper echelon of high-class clients. Sometimes, if a deal could be struck, they'd exchange services for personal favors instead of cash. Keeping a wealthy clientele served madams more than just monetarily. It also helped them collect and deposit favors, allowing madams to gain substantial influence as a result. In Lexington, Kentucky, Madame Belle Brezing catered only to the classiest of men. She gained a national reputation by pleasuring businessmen, army officers, and members of the upper class. Her reputation clearly stuck because she ended up being the model for Belle in Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind. Because madams needed to keep the public happy to avoid getting shut down, many provided social support programs like buying clothes and school supplies for poor children or donating books to the local library. Charities were sometimes fickle and would accept the madams' money, but then bar them from attending social gatherings or withholding any sort of acknowledgement. How rude. 
Madams went out of their way to pay their share of taxes, not willing to offend the locals, which would risk their businesses. Madam Jessie Reeves gave generously to the children and the homeless, and she provided blankets and food to firefighters battling blazes that threatened to burn down the town. True patriots. On the other hand, madams weren't afraid to throw down. Cad Thompson, a madam in Virginia City, Nevada, was a jumpy madam who fought with customers and employees alike. Thompson was a keen businesswoman who ran a 24-hour brothel. One time, during an argument with one of her employees, Mary Livingston, a brawl broke out between the two women. Thompson gave Livingston a full-blown beatdown oh. before eventually throwing her out of the boarding house. Livingston took Thompson to court, but the case ended in an acquittal for the madam. To keep customers coming back for more, madams had to ensure a certain level of, uh, satisfaction. The best establishments provided well-dressed, good-looking women along with plenty of booze and entertainment. Madams went to great lengths to meet customers' needs, offering blondes to men who preferred fair hair or supplying shapely women to men who liked their ladies biggin'. Madams charmed the men so they would stay longer, spend money, and return for more. Gorgeous houses with spacious rooms full of lavish interior design didn't hurt either. Jenny Rogers earned her name Queen of the Row thanks to the elaborate decor of her establishments in Denver, Colorado. Madams realized how to use their wiles and staff of women effectively. Madams like Tessie Wall dressed their girls in the finest European fashions and paraded them through town to drum up business. She also made grand entrances at public events, along with her best looking ladies, for attention. Her competition, Madam Jessie Heyman, met the challenge and started imitating Wall. This prompted Wall to withhold girls from these events, which only garnered more awareness. Parades, stunts, manipulation, and casual lies were all part of a madam's repertoire. Resourcefulness could mean blackmail, something Jenny Rogers parlayed into a $17,000 payday when she threatened to expose a local politician as a frequent customer. Cha-ching! Madams weren't beneath bribes, payoffs, or other under-the-table dealings with bellboys, hotel clerks, and owners of local establishments, all in the interest of getting more men into the door. Just because you were a brothel owner didn't mean you didn't have your own family life. Maddie Silks married several times and eventually adopted the daughter of one of her lovers, Court Thompson. In Boulder, Colorado, Madam Sue Fee left behind a young son when she died in 1877. Texas Madam Squirrel Tooth Alice, known for her appearance, as her given name was Mary Elizabeth Libby Haley Thompson, had nine children. Though she had a husband, William Texas Billy Thompson, at least three of her kids were fathered by other men. Did all of her kids have squirrel teeth? Unfortunately, that's a fact we're not so sure about. Imagine being a mid-1800s harlot and then not getting to keep any of your profits. Well, that really happened. Madams could sometimes be pretty cutthroat bosses. Many madams housed their girls and straight up took 100% of their profits as payment. If a client paid $5 for a girl's company, this could cover the expenses for her $5 room and board. Girls who made more than this could apply their surplus funds to food, clothing, or other items. Some madams weren't generous, and girls who didn't make enough could get thrown out into the street. That's not very nice. Aside from profiting off the sex trade, madams also raked in the dough from gambling and booze at their establishments. Madams could get away with jacking up the price of alcohol by as much as 60% or water down the booze to maximize profits. Some saloon girls made money off the alcohol they sold, but these funds usually went back to the madam to cover the cost of clothes or other amenities. In addition, madams sometimes had their saloon girls steal from their unconscious clients. It wasn't unheard of for a guy to pass out and wake up with no money, another interesting way of turning tricks. Criminals in the Wild West frequented seedy and fancy parlors alike. Fanny Porter, a madam in Texas, was friendly with the infamous Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid hosting the Wild Bunch when they had their last meetup in 1901. The women here were technically criminals and many spent time in jail. Through their madam's acumen and bribery, the girls rarely went to jail for professional activities, but they sometimes did for other offenses. In 1891, authorities arrested Ardell Smith, Blanche Morgan, Maddie Fisher, and Molly White, all prostitutes in Denver, Colorado, for poisoning a client with morphine in order to steal from him. Despite their success, madams like Jenny Rogers and Maddie Silk spent their lives miserable and plagued by addiction. 
Maddie Silks fell for Court Thompson, a man who never treated her well and leached off her money until his death in 1900. Both Silks and Thompson were big drinkers, something that contributed to their contentious relationship. Madame Sue Fee passed away from an overdose in 1877, a habit that also took the life of Pearl de Vere in 1897. Known for her elaborate celebrations, de Vere retired to her bedroom one night after having too much to drink. She took too much morphine and never woke up. Their lives may not have been glamorous, but they gave back to their communities and made the best as single independent women in the rough and tumble Wild West. Next time you're gambling at your local brothel, have a watered down whiskey for the women who ran the West.